Welcome to the 1515, a 15-minute podcast brought to you by the regulatory legal experts at the Maples Group. Here, you will learn more about the latest developments in the regulatory laws of the Cayman Islands on the 15th day of every month. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of our 1515 podcast. My name is Patrick Head and I'm a partner in the regulatory and financial services team here at Maples and Calder. Joining me today is fellow regulatory partner Adam Huckle and associate Alan O'Brien. In this edition of our 1515 podcast, we will be covering sanctions update and an extension to the general license, AEI updates. SEMA uh, has published a, a notification regarding the refund of fees with respect to certain SPC vehicles. SEMA have also published a response to the consultations on internal controls and corporate governance. There have also been a number of amendment bills published in the last month. And we'll briefly be mentioning special edition podcast in respect to the Silicon Valley bank collapse. Please note that the contents of this podcast do not constitute legal advice and should be taken as general update only. Before we get going, just some light housekeeping to cover. If listening from your usual podcast app, you'll find any resource documents or speaker information in the description. And if you've clicked on the media player link sent via email, you can find this information in the notes section. Last but not least, don't forget to subscribe to the Maples 1515 podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. That's it. Now let's get started. So, Adam, if I can now uh, start with you, I understand there have been some updates in relation to the sanctions and, and the extension of the general license. If you're able to take us through that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Pat. So I, I wanted to address three relatively recent updates as regards the Cayman Island sanctions regime, particularly in respect to Russia. So first, the as Pat just said, the general license that's applicable to Cayman Islands investment funds whose assets are frozen pursuant to those Russia sanctions. Secondly, some relatively recent updates to the prohibitions on providing trust, professional and business services to designated persons and persons connected with Russia. And thirdly, some helpful guidance from the UK authorities on what to look for in terms of sanctions evasion risk and what sort of due diligence is required when considering levels of ownership and control. So addressing the, the general license for funds first. When the principal Russia sanctions were first imposed in the first quarter of last year, as Russia invaded Ukraine. Cayman Islands investment funds that were deemed to be you know, directly or indirectly owned or controlled by a designated person. So for example, typically as a result of a designated person holding directly or indirectly more than 50% of the issued share capital or equivalent of the fund, they were, they were faced with significant legal and practical difficulties. You know, as a result of the assets of the fund being frozen. Redemptions, withdrawals, those were impossible, and neither could the fund pay its service providers, with one result being the risk that some service providers, including registered office providers, resigned from their positions, which, in the case of an RO, can lead to the risk of the fund being struck from the register. So to ex assist with those difficulties, a general license was granted in October last year that, subject to certain ongoing reporting and record retention requirements, allowed an investment fund owned or controlled directly and directly by a Russian-related designated person to redeem, to withdraw, or otherwise deal with those shares, interests, etc. held by the non-sanctioned investors so basically getting the, allowing the non-sanctioned investors to exit the fund and to pay fees and expenses for maintaining the remaining frozen funds and economic resources, including allowing the fund to pay the fees of its service providers and legal advisors. So that general license was set to expire on the 4th of April this year, but thankfully the governor of the Cayman Islands announced on the day that it expired that the general license would be extended for another six months, so until early September 2023. 
So that's good news. Thanks, Adam. So yeah, that's actually quite useful, obviously, for those funds that are currently relying on the general license. And of course, for any funds in the future, well, certainly within the next six months, that may be going into winding down and uh, need to rely on that extended license in order to complete their winding down process. That's right, Pat. Okay, so so moving just on to trust professional and business services, there are prohibitions within the relevant sanctions regulations with respect to Russia, whereby in relation to trust services, a person cannot provide trust services to or for the benefit of a designated person or any person connected with Russia. And a person connected with Russia is wider than the list of designated persons. It, it includes, for example, any individual who's ordinarily resident in Russia and any person or corporate that's not an individual that's incorporated, constituted, or domiciled in Russia. Now, the recent change here is that although there is an exception for the provision of trust services to persons connected with Russia, that relates to engagements that pre-exist the 19th of December 2022, the recently imposed prohibition on providing trust services to the nigh on 2,000 or so designated persons, i.e. those that are listed on the UK consolidated list, is definitive, and that exception doesn't apply. So there is so as to allow for entities to extract themselves from those trust service relationships. There is a general license both in the UK and in the Cayman Islands allowing a 90-day wind-down period from those services. There is also a prohibition, as everyone should know, on the provision of professional and business services to persons connected with Russia. And there, one cannot directly or indirectly, for example, provide accounting or auditing services to a person connected with Russia, having the same meaning as I explained in relation to trust services. There are similar prohibitions on advertising, architectural, management, consulting, IT, design, and public relations services as well. But it's typically in our practice, the accounting or auditing services that we most often come across. There are some exceptions to those prohibitions, but those are, in our experience, very much designed with the UK in mind. So for example, there's an exception for accounting services required under UK statute. And the specific exceptions for auditing services are mostly in the context of group audits, which don't ordinarily apply, at least directly to an investment fund context. So Adam, I mean, that, that's interesting, but do those same exceptions that are provided uh, with respect to the UK um, sort of accounting services, do those also extend automatically into Cayman um, or is it variations needed to allow for accounting services to be provided uh, for, by, by Cayman audit firms as well to, to clients? Yeah, there are exceptions within the, the statutory instrument that extends the UK regulation to the Cayman Islands. So there, there are exceptions that apply specifically in relation to accounting services. The audit services, auditing services exceptions, as I say, don't really apply to the investment fund context. So, you know, auditors in particular have been having to consider those prohibitions, including in relation to the statutory orders that they are required or engaged to provide, and that's a required to be undertaken by um, regulated registered mutual funds and registered private funds here in the Cayman Islands. So I also wanted to cover some recent helpful guidance from the sanctions authorities in the UK. The first of which was the red alert that was published back in July last year by the UK Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation, OFSI, and the UK National Crime Agency, amongst others. This was obviously last year, but it does provide industry with indicators, key indicators of sanctions evasion and common examples of where sanction evasion has been seen by the authorities. The, the second one is the recent OFSI guidance from March of this year, which is in relation to the enforcement and monetary penalties for breaches of financial sanctions in the UK. 
that document was made, or those, that guidance was made in the context of a civil enforcement regime that's not currently applicable in the Cayman Islands, it is in the UK. But what it says specifically about due diligence, ownership, control, et cetera, would in, in our view be very persuasive in the Cayman Islands. So for example, it gives some very good guidance as to the level of due diligence expected of entities where there is potential for influence or de facto control by a designated person. And I think both of those guided documents when put together are helpful in particular for boards of Cayman Island investment funds that are considering whether their registered investors are owned or controlled directly or indirectly by a designated person and or whether redemptions, withdrawals, payments to those registered investors might be considered making those funds available directly or indirectly to or for the benefit of a designated person. So there's certainly something to have in everyone's sanctions locker. No, thanks for that, Adam. I mean, that, that's a very detailed update and I'm sure it's super helpful to, to a lot of our listeners and I sort of agree that that you know, more recent guidance will be you know, very useful to, to a lot of funds and their operators in the coming months. So, Alan, if I can bring you into the discussion now, we're sort of turning now to the recent AELI updates, in particular in relation to our understanding. I mean, additions to the reportable jurisdiction lists under under the CRS regime. That's right. Thanks, Pat. On the 5th of April, we saw that an industry advisory was issued by the DITC. And this advisory notified us that there was updated lists of CRS participating jurisdictions and reportable jurisdictions in the Cayman Islands Gazette. This was published on the 31st of March. Our listeners should note that the following jurisdictions have been added for reports due in 2023. And these jurisdictions include Jordan, Montenegro, Uganda, Moldova, Thailand and Ukraine. For those listeners interested, the complete list may be accessed on the DITC's website, and that is ditc.ky. Thanks, Alan. And have there been any changes with respect to this year's reporting reporting deadlines at all? Yes, that's right. Within the industry advisory that was issued, that their AEOI reporting deadlines in 2023 are as follows, and our listeners should take note that CRS and FATCA notification for registration is on Monday, the 1st of May, 2023. And this is because the statutory deadline of the 30th of April, 2023 falls on a Sunday. So to note that Monday deadline of the 1st of May. Secondly, in relation to CRS and FATCA reporting, including any reportable accounts and or CRS filing declarations, the deadline is the 31st of July, 2023. And finally, in relation to the CRS compliance form, the deadline there is the 15th of September, 2023. Another update from the DITC is that they have recently published an updated version of the DITC portal user guide. And this version is now version 9.3. So very important for listeners to ensure that you're using the latest version of the guide as published by the DITC. The guide updates include refreshed images of a number of portal screens with enhanced instructions to assist filers. Listeners should also note the new email addresses for the DITC. So in relation to CRS and FATCA, the new email address is ditc.portal at gov.ky. And in relation to economic substance, the new email address is ditc.escompliance at gov.ky. Thanks for that, Alan. And was I correct in also seeing recently um, a notification from SEMA relating to the refund of fees? That's correct, Pat. On the 22nd of March, SEMA published a notice advising financial services providers that with immediate effect, it will no longer collect annual registration fees on behalf of segregated portfolios for private funds. So for these SPCs, the refund of fees for SPCs that are registered as private funds We understand that a new statutory based registration fee will follow and that SEMA is currently in discussion with the Ministry of Financial Services and Commerce regarding that amendment. And finally, to note that there has been no statement in relation to the mutual fund SPCs. 
Okay, thanks for that, Alan. So I think um, people will be sitting waiting now to see if there is any change there for mutual funds, but obviously quite good news. Um, and then from for, for our private fund client listeners, we did also see just in terms of SEMA um, notifications, a response which they published to industry on the 31st of March, which was in relation to the consultations which originally came out, I think it was in late summer of last year and then September in relation to the proposed measures for the new rule and statement of guidance on internal controls for regulated entities and a rule on corporate governance for regulated entities. I think there was a statement of guidance as well on, on corporate governance for mutual funds and private funds and certain amendments to other regulatory measures that were going to become applicable for virtual asset service providers and other regulated entities. Now, I think that we, the, the consultation that we saw, it, it appears that SEMA have taken on board um, sort of industry feedback that was provided in relation to those various rules and SOGs. We understand at the moment that the uh, final measures are yet to be published, although the consultation draft pages um, appear to be, uh, have been moved into the prior consultation tab on SEMA's website. So I think that listeners can expect that the final measures and their publication should be relatively imminent. We do understand as well that the revised rules and SOGs won't take effect for at least six months from their date of publication. So there will be a period of time where we can digest what the final versions look like and obviously the uh, follow-on practical implications of that before, before those, those, those papers become live. And Alan, just to sort of turn back to you, I understand there's also, I think, a, a number of draft amendment bills that we saw published just in the last couple of weeks. Are you able just to take us through those quickly? Yes, that's correct, Pat. Seven amendment bills were published in the Cayman Islands Gazette. The amendment bills are as follows. We saw the Monetary Authority Amendment Bill, the Companies Management Amendment Bill, the Directors Registration and Licensing Amendment Bill, Insurance Amendment Bill, the Money Services Amendment Bill, the Securities Investment Business Amendment Bill, and the Virtual Asset Service Providers Amendment Bill. And I suppose the key intent behind the amendment bills is to ensure that partnerships and other unincorporated associations and persons concerned in their management or control will fall in the scope of the administrative fines regime. Thanks, Alan. So yeah, I think that's important for listeners to be aware of. Obviously, operators of partnerships and other unincorporated societies so now be aware that they are in scope of the admin fines regime. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to also touch on, obviously, a, a quick sort of flag really about a, a Silicon Valley bank update. I think most listeners will be aware that SEMA issued an initial public statement um, on, on about the 15th of March on the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and the intervention by the FDIC in the US, where SEMA confirmed that they were obviously uh, in contact with the FDIC and keeping a careful sort of eye on what was happening with respect to the Cayman Islands branch. We then saw a further update being published by SEMA at the end of March, noting that it has continued to engage with the FDIC and other stakeholders regarding the now, now receivership process that's underway in the US and how that may impact on the Cayman Islands branch of the bank. We also understand that the FDIC will soon be issuing notices to customers of the Cayman Island branch of, of SVB regarding next steps. So I'd also just uh, like to flag to listeners that they should watch out for our special in-depth podcast that colleagues uh, Daniel Moore and Andrew Wood in our Hong Kong office will be publishing in the coming weeks. So that's it for today's episode. Thanks, Adam and Alan, for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate. And to our listeners, thank you for listening and subscribing.